Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Grim Dark History Podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. I'm your host, Jeremy Agnew, and what we do if this is your first time tuning into the podcast is we take a look at the real history of times, places, and historical people that popular fiction pulls into its own lore. You may have been reading a book, watching a movie, a TV show, maybe playing a video game that set itself in our own history, and you may have asked your question, was it really like that? Did it really happen that way? How much of this is real versus the people who are writing the show, doing the book, the author, whatever that is, how much artistic license are they taking to tell me a good story. That's what this show does. We want to get into the nitty gritty details, all the fun, interesting facts and insanity that often happens that makes history oftentimes more unbelievable than the fiction that you're reading and what might have brought you to this show. We have been right now in the middle of a series of episodes on a time period in Roman history known as the Crisis of the 3rd Century. We have been this entire season one exploring all the historical times and places and people that a fictional figure known as the Emperor of Mankind that he has been in our own history. If you're not familiar with it, he's from the popular fictional universe Warhammer 40,000, and he's an immortal human who pops in and out of our ancient history uh, throughout time. We're on the last figure he we know him to be in this popular fiction, and that is the historical figure of St. George, and we have been exploring for the last few episodes the time and place of St. George. Now, if you're just tuning in, you might want to go back a couple episodes to the start of this series. That's the episode entitled Christians in the Early Roman Empire. As we're exploring the history of St. George, I'm going to give you a little summary of the episode. So in episode one, Christians in the Early Roman Empire, we explored some of the earliest non-biblical accounts of Christians in the Roman Empire. We looked at a Roman governor who uncovers a sect of Christians in his province and what he does to those Christians and seeking the official advice from the emperor Trajan. We look at the accounts of saints Perpetua and Felicity, who were Christians that were caught up in uh, persecution in Carthage, and we look at a Roman legion that was entirely made up of Christians right around the crisis of the 3rd century. In the second episode in this series, that's entitled The Crisis of the 3rd Century, we look at the lead-up to the crisis of the 3rd century. We go through all the insanity that happened up until the year 260, where the Roman Empire completely falls apart, and a Roman emperor named Gallienus is left holding the bag and trying to figure out how do I bring it all together. In this episode, we are going to be looking at how Gallienus brings the empire back together, how his heirs Gothicus and Aurelian continue that plan of stitching things together, and then how that wraps up and leads into what will be the final episode in this series. I was hoping I would be able to wrap this all up in a neat bow for you this month, Um, but I trying my hardest after my first few episodes that kind of went Dan Carlin long on uh, uh, length to try and keep my episodes to somewhere around an hour, an hour and a half in length and not have the Dan Carlin um, marathon episodes. 
I love Dan Carlin. I'm not criticizing the length of his episodes. I just find that uh, this enables a better pace of release schedule. So I wanted to try and squeeze in all the way up to Diocletian, the Tetrarchy, and of course the Christian persecutions and the life and time of St. George. But I found this episode was going longer than I was comfortable with. And I want to say hello to all my new listeners who are on the Ancient Rome History subreddit. We got into a conversation about Aurelian a few days ago. Well, a few days for me, probably a few weeks from you if you're listening to this episode. But I wanted, after that conversation, to put a little more effort into my biography of Aurelian and going around that. And, you know, Aurelian needed his due. And so I wanted to say thank you to all the people on that forum for your comments and all the new subscribers that I have. And we're going to go into Aurelian in a little more detail. And I also want to say thank you to Spotify user Fenris, who was kind enough to drop a comment on the forum to my last episode on the crisis of the third century. I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's dive right in and let's figure out what how the Roman Empire gets back together. When we last left off in 260, the senior Emperor Valerian had been captured in a failed assault on the Persian Sasanian Empire. Valerian's son, Gallienus, is the co-emperor of the West. Valerian was the emperor of the East. So we're in a period of dual emperors, with Valerian being the acknowledged senior emperor. After Valerian's capture, Gallienus is dealing with some severe consequences. As we were talking about in the previous episode, there had been successive decades of wars happening on all fronts and emperors being forced to order legions from one end of the province or empire that's currently under attack to abandon their homes, their families, the defense of their homelands, and march thousands of kilometers across the empire to fight at the opposite end of the empire, a group of people that have nothing to do with them, their families back home. This caused severe morale issues, People were seeing that the emperor's successive empires were incapable of defending the provinces they were in. The Edict of Caracalla had made all free peoples of the empire Roman citizen. And while that added tax money into the the, uh, coffers of the Roman emperor, It had the knock-on effect of enabling these people who grew up and lived in these provinces to achieve positions of governorship, to be members of the legions, to be senior officers in the legions. They could join the Senate and equestrian ranks. Several of these people became Roman emperors, but also many of these people are the Roman governors and uh, heads of the legions sitting in these outer provinces of the Roman Empire. So previously to the Edict of Caracalla, the heads of the legions, the governors of the provinces, were all made up of 100% Roman citizens that were all for the core defense of Rome and what was best for Rome the city. In 260 and in the decades leading up to that, the repercussions of the Edict of Caracalla forced a radical reorientation of what was important 
because these people who hadn't previously been citizens who didn't have opportunities to have any say in how their local government and defense forces functioned, they're now all in the positions of powers. They're the ones making up the vast majority of the legions. And when a foreign emperor orders them to abandon their homes and families in the defense, they have the power and opportunity to reject that in either choose to break away or elect a local person as the new emperor and support them to take over the empire and then put the interests of their province ahead of the rest of the empire. This had successive emperors doing this. There were lots of breakaway states. We talked all about this in the previous episode, the decades leading up to 260. So in 260, with Valerian, the senior emperor, the prisoner of the Sasanian Persians, and the junior emperor, Valerian's son, this is a man by the name of uh, Gallianus, Gallianus is now the sole emperor, and he is left with some decisions there, so he wants to pull legions away from Gaul and from the provinces around Moesia, that would be the Adriatic provinces, that would be modern-day Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, parts of Hungary, parts of Bulgaria, southern parts of Ukraine, and uh, kind of Thrace, you know, the, the area leading up to Greece and into Turkey. He wants to pull legions away from there, pull legions away from Gaul, pull legions away from Britannia, pull legions away from Spain in order to go and free his father, beat down the Persians, teach them a lesson. The outer provinces have finally had enough. Gallienus has multiple problems dumped on his lap. Not only is the senior father, or pardon me, the senior emperor gone, that's a huge blow to the honor and authority of his family and their ability to run an empire. And so once the news of this travels to Gaul, the governor of Gaul, a man by the name of Postumus, rather than you know, seeing the writing on the wall, well, uh, Gallienus is going to pull a bunch of legions away and they're going to march us all the way across the empire. And we're currently, right now, in the middle of continuous renewed assaults by various Germanic tribes. And so Postumus declares independence, sets up what's known as the Gallic Empire, they don't really consider it a Gallic empire. They consider it Rome. And they consider Postumus the emperor of Rome. And Britannia, the province of Britannia and Spain, both of them declare for Postumus. So in a matter of just a few months, Gallienus has lost the entirety of Spain the entirety of Gaul, which is modern-day France and Switzerland and parts of Germany. And he's lost all of Britannia in just a couple of months. All of them see him as too weak and unable to defend the empire, and they all throw their support behind Postumus. In the east, this is where now the governor of Palmyra, that's modern-day Syria, Levant, Mesopotamia, so the kind of Mideast regions that we know today as Syria, Palestine, Israel, Iran, or pardon me, Iraq, not Iran, and Croatia. These areas are under the control of local regional governors, but as if you were with me in my last episode, we had a few instances of the governors in those regions breaking away and revolting against the empire because, of course, they're right on the doorstep of the Persian Sasanians. And when the Sasanians want to conquer and retake their ancient lands that belonged to the Persian Empire a few hundred years ago, 
they're the first ones that have to deal with that. And of course, if the entirety of Gaul, Britannia, and Spain is broken away, well, Gallienus might want to take legions from their area that are needed to defend against the very real war of the Sustanians currently happening and pull those legions away and go retake Gaul or Britannia or Spain. And so Palmyra declares independence. And a big problem for Gallienus, it's twofold with Palmyra losing the Mideast provinces. One, Palmyra is a major cash cow. It's a it's at the borders of the Silk Road trade route. It's one of the most popular land trade routes of the Silk Road to get into the, uh, pardon me, the Western Roman provinces. So it's a giant cash cow of revenue that's lost when they break away, but also a healthy chunk of the entire Roman Empire treasury was with Valerian and his army when they're captured. And the breakaway general in the east, that's a guy by the name of Macrianus, he's the one who takes that treasury with him as he seizes control of Palmyra and the Mideast provinces. So Gallienus has lost the wealth of the Mideast, the valuable trade routes that are coming there. He's lost a healthy chunk of the Roman treasury in that same break-off, and he's lost his father also in that same event. He's also lost all of Spain, all of Gaul, and all of Britannia. So the empire is less than half the size of what it was just a few months earlier. So Gallienus is faced with probably the worst hand of cards you could be dealt in poker. And so he is forced to make some radical and hard-nosed decisions. They may or may not have been intended to be short or long-term decisions. But regardless, Gallienus has to guarantee the loyalty of the few legions that are left with him. And the legions that he has with him are remnants of what a full legion is. He's been fighting for almost 10 years with this group of legions. So they're not full legions. They haven't been reinforced in a while. But they are battle hardened and battle tested legions that are with him and he needs to guarantee their loyalty and so gallienus has to implement a number of reforms and i'm going to quote patricia southern who i've been drawing from uh, throughout this series on the crisis of the third century Quoting Patricia Southern, From the reign of Gallienus, the Roman world entered upon a period of change, and though the changes may not have been intended to be permanent, by degrees they became entrenched and in some cases irrevocable. Forced to make the best use of what was immediately to hand, and with no time for vacillations or trial runs, Gallienus adapted old and established methods and produced something new, sometimes sacrificing hollow traditions as if they were not suited to his current circumstances. End quote. Everything about what was left of the empire was subordinated to the needs of the army in order to guarantee their loyalty. He's got the grain supplies from Egypt and North Africa. He has some trading from the Black Sea's ports. So he's got some revenue coming in. He has the core of the Italian peninsula. But the, you know, the cash cow provinces, that's Palmyra. That's out of his control. And of course, he's lost the treasury. And I'm not sure if you know this, but one thing that Romans did up until this very point is they basically outsourced taxation. 
senators or equestrians could bid to the Roman Empire that they would bring in, you know, X amount of annual taxes from this province. And then they would be effectively awarded a kind of contract, the right to collect taxes there, and they could go to those provinces and do whatever they needed to collect those taxes, and whatever was extra, they get to keep. That's how tax collectors made their money, and many, many wealthy Romans became vastly more wealthy by exploiting this. Gallienus, one of his reforms, takes that away from the Senate. He removes the outsourcing of tax collecting and puts it directly into the hands of his legions so that A, he can guarantee his legions are getting paid and nobody's trying to skim money off the top in a time when he needs to guarantee his legions are going to get paid. So this enables the legions that are collecting money to become incredibly wealthy. Now, of course, the senators aren't going to like this, but Gallienus doesn't care. In fact, Gallienus doubles down against the Senate because also, up until this very moment, senators, and, uh, pardon me, senators had been guaranteed command positions within the legions. They were the generals, they were the senior officers, and this enabled a lot of sneaky and ambitious senators to foment revolts, engineer assassinations, and create new emperors. Gallienus removes the right of any senator, the hereditary officer and leadership positions within the Roman legions. Instead, he institutes a kind of hyper meritocracy where plebeians, you know, these are the Roman citizens that basically were not equestrian or senatorial ranks. So the lowest of the low class, you know, the, the sword and board spearman, the guy that's sitting at the front line of all the assaults. Whoever is competent at that level, they are promoted into the non-commissioned officer ranks, and the non-commissioned officers are promoted to the heads of the legions. This opened up opportunities, along with the tax collecting, for people who were Roman citizens but otherwise were nobodies in the empire to attain vast wealth, and to obtain vast military glory and loyalty of the legions. In addition to this, Gallienus lets the legions wear white clothing. And you might be scratching your head on that. Oh, well, white clothing, why is that such a big deal? I thought purple clothing was the only thing that was really important, or maybe the senatorial red lining, the red robes. But white clothing was not allowed in the legionaries because white is an extremely difficult color fabric to keep clean. So legions were often um, banned from wearing white because, so that they didn't have to worry about keeping them so clean. Gallienus allows the legionaries to wear white, and of course he bears the cost for making sure the legionaries' clothes are clean. So the legions that are under Gallienus's command are seeing opportunities for advancement, opportunities to obtain new wealth that never would have been possible. They're being dressed up in all the latest nice shiny clothing. He's really showing the love to the legions. And the motley crew of the legions that he does have, these are some of the legions that were with him from the Rhine, and mostly from the Danube and Illyrium area. So that's the Adriatic provinces and Greece, kind of northern Greece, Macedonia, that, that type of air, pardon me, region. It's a motley crew. They've been fighting for 10 years. They're battle-hardened, but of course they've suffered losses. They're partial legions with auxiliary forces. Gallienus takes all the little 
cavalry units that were part of all the individual legions and part of the auxiliary forces and instead removes them from the legion and piles them all together and creates a vast thousand strong uh, mobile infantry or pardon me mobile cavalry army previously the cavalry had been small components of individual legionary forces Gallienus pulls them out and creates a cavalry-specific army to enable rapid response to the regions that he has left to defend. And then he reforms the existing partial legions into brand new legions. And on top of that, he needs to grow the legions and reinforce them. So he ends the policy of Christian persecution that his father, Valerian, and the previous emperor, I think it was Decius, instituted and continued throughout their reigns. I think that this is probably more a practical uh, thing than him being a bleeding heart for Christians. He needs bodies to pay taxes he needs bodies to become part of the legions so he removes this persecution of christians so long as you swear loyalty to the emperor you're good to practice your faith out in the open and you can become part of the legions you have opportunities for advancement opportunities to be the you know the tax collector to become a head of the legion an officer you could obtain equestrian rank so there's real opportunity for christians who have been persecuted for about a you know two decades to suddenly step forward and get some advancement and betterment of their lifestyles so we have an idea of some of the major reforms and innovations to the Roman army and how the Roman Empire functioned, the rights of senators, equestrians, the no-name people that are suddenly having opportunities co to collect vast amounts of wealth and get advancement to equestrian senatorial ranks. We've got an idea of what's happening inside Rome proper. Gallienus, with his hardcore Roman legions that he's reforming into brand new apex predators, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place, though. Because there is, of course, Posthumus in Gaul, who has a massive chunk of the Roman Empire under his sway, all of Spain, all of Gaul, all of Britannia, and there's piles and piles of legions there. So there is a real threat from Gallienus's perspective that Posthumus will take those legions and try to invade Rome and seize the entirety of the empire. Also, just on the other side of the Alps, this would be, you know, in and around modern-day Switzerland and those areas. The Alamanni and a few other Germanic tribes are doing very successful raids, and they're right, literally, right on the doorstep to get into Italy. And then there is the problems with the Eastern Empire, but at least for the moment... He's not worried about them coming to invade Rome because the Palmeran breakaway Roman emperor is stuck dealing with the Sasanian Persians. So his real threat is from the areas of Gaul, so Switzerland, France, those regions, and he sets up in Milan, which at the time is a heavily fortified plain city that's great for cavalry armies, and it's right at the strategic location of the exit to the Alps, so it's a good place to bottleneck armies trying to come out and they can use and he can use his vast cavalry in the plains in and around Milan so it's a extraordinarily strategic spot and he's kind of forced to be stuck there but while we're having an understanding of Gallienus let's take a look at what is happening 
in Gaul and the breakaway Roman emperor there, Postumus. Of course, he's dealing with the continued invasions of Germanic tribes, so that would be Franks, Goths, Alamanni, Marcomanni, you know, all, you know, all, all the Germanic tribes. Not all of them, but you know what I'm saying, what I'm trying to get at. This has been going on for 30 years, continuous, well, near continuous invasions or border raids back and forth between the decades of 230 and 260 some 86 separate roman forts along the rhine borders were either attacked or destroyed according to archaeological finds and the written records by 260 almost the entirety of the roman forts along the rhines have been destroyed obliterating whatever it was the Romans considered a frontier between themselves and the Germanic tribes. Instead of a walled frontier manned by Roman forts and soldiers, the idea of fortified cities and walls surrounding those cities began to form as a critical defense requirement for Postumus. And the breakaway emperor Posthumus, as I said at the start, considers himself Rome. He considers himself the emperor of Rome. And the citizens within Gaul, Britannia, and Spain are all Romans. And so Posthumus sets up a senate there. There are elected consuls there. The Posthumus annually goes to the Senate and is reinvested with the powers of emperor by the Senate. So he's created a breakaway government in Gaul. And his focus is entirely on the defense of the the defense of the Rhine and the disappearing frontiers. So as much as Gallienus is worried about Posthumus invading Rome, Posthumus is spending the entirety of his reign fighting off the Germanic tribes. In the east, I talked briefly about Macrianus, who seized the treasury that was with them and, pardon me, took control of Palmyra. Well, a local kind of not quite senator, not not equestrian. He's not even a Roman, an acknowledged Roman citizen, but he was a wealthy, powerfully connected merchant, a man by the name of Odenathus. He is able to raise armies and attack and destroy Macrianus, seizing the treasury that he had taken with him. And Palmyra and Odenathus operates as a kind of vassal but not vassal independent but not independent of gallienus he's not declaring himself emperor but he's issuing coins with himself as the head and in you know acknowledging that there is a roman emperor but he is running palmyra on behalf of the emperor, and of course Gallienus can't really do anything about that. He has to accept that Odenathus is being loyal to Rome, but he doesn't really have any say. You know, if he puts a request in for him to send legions, Odenathus is going to politely decline. Gallienus can't really take legions away to go and attack Palmyra and settle the issue, because if he does that, he's worried about the Germanic tribes in Switzerland coming down, or potentially Posthumus coming down, of course, taking the Italian peninsula and the city of Rome. Odenathus, as much as he loved his new power, was definitely loyal to Rome in some form. He sends armies into Turkey to put down pirate attacks while also repelling the Sasanians. He very easily could have left the province of Turkey and, you know, the various city Roman provinces there to their own due. 
but instead he pulls legions away from the Sasanians to go and deal with the Goths and the increasing uh, pir- pardon me, pirate attacks on the tra- port and trade cities. Odenathus does die, though, through, I think, natural causes, and his wife takes over as regent for her two young sons. And it's at this point when Odenathus' wife takes over as regent, her name is Zenobia, that there is a definite 100% break from Rome. As much as Odenathus was kind of a vassal of Gallienus, but not, Zenobia is definitely not a vassal of Gallienus. And when Gallienus sent a new governor, a man by the name of Heraclianus, to take charge of the East after Odenathus dies, Zenobia is able to either uh, kill Heraclianus or send him packing, so she clearly has the backing of the local armies there. Gallienus, of course, can't do a thing about it without giving an opening to Postumus or the Germanic raiders to get into the Italian peninsula. And so Gallienus is forced to accept, at least for the short term, that the valuable Mideastern provinces are going to remain under the control of Zenobia, who is definitely a badass, one of the few badass women that you hear about in the ancient history books. So with this in mind, we've got uh, Posthumus of the Gallic Empire, we have Zenobia of the Palmeran breakaway state, and we have uh, Gallienus of the core of the Roman Empire. So we have three main forces, and of course, outside these main forces is still the Sasanian Persians, still all the various Germanic tribes, and still the internal politicking that happens during the reign of any average Roman. By 262, 263, you know, somewhere around that time, Gallienus is in as high spirits as you could be for being an emperor whose father is lost to the Persians and who's lost basically two-thirds of the Roman Empire. He's in rarefied air because he's one of the very few Roman emperors during this period who survives 10 years on the job. If you were with me in the first, or pardon me, in the last episode, I talked about what the average life expectancy of a Roman emperor was during this time, and it's less than three years. Gallienus is able to celebrate a, uh, pardon me, a 10-year anniversary of being the emperor. That's been a first for decades. Peace wasn't to last, though. Uh, From 265 to 267, Gallienus was basically locked in perpetual wars, either a failed attempt to retake Gaul from Postumus, and then locked into a war alongside uh, Moesia in Greece against the Goths and Heruli, who are uh, successfully invading Greece and sacking major Greece cities. Gallienus has to return to Milan to put down a revolt by one of his generals, and during this, uh, pardon me, uh, during this revolt, he seems to have been assassinated by an insider in his own officer corps. A guy by the name of Heraclianus engineers the assassination of Gallienus, and Gallienus' successor, a uh, guy with the badass name of Gothicus, uh, Claudius Gothicus has the job for about two years before he dies to a uh, plague. If you're anywhere near Rome and you'd like to go and see the tomb of Gallienus, you can. Gallienus is supposed to be, pardon me, supposedly buried at the ninth milestone marker south of Rome on the Via Appia. 
So you can head nine miles south of Rome along the Via Appia, and there is an unexcavated tomb, I believe, on the western side of the road. And this is where Gallienus and a few other Roman emperors are supposedly buried. Gothicus, again, as I said, he only lives about two years. He doesn't really have an opportunity to do much other than uh, take it to the Alemanni and, you know, locked in continual warfare against them. The Gallic Empire, though, is beginning to crumble. And under the internal and external uh, stresses of the Gallic Empire, Spain breaks away and returns to the fold of Rome, pledging for Gothicus. The Goths by now, though, they've been doing this for a few decades, this seaborne piratical raiding. They're becoming experts at using kind of troop transport ships to make lightning landings. They raid cities, take slaves and loots, and then slide away into the Black Sea with a lot of booty before any response can be mounted. And when I was reading about the Goths, the kind of pirate Black Sea raiding they were doing, these troop transport ships that slide in, raid a city, take loot, slaves, and then leave. I couldn't help but be reminded of the Viking raiders that will be hitting the uh, Britannic and northern France coasts in a few hundred years. And I wondered to myself how much of the seafaring know-how and this tactic of, you know, take the ships in, lightning fast, raid a city, and then leave, how much of that knowledge transfers to the northern tribes that are, or peoples that are making up Norway, Denmark, Sweden, those areas that will eventually evolve into the Viking forces in a few hundred years' time. Gothicus' brother takes over the title of emperor, but he either survives for days or months uh, before he's supplanted by the emperor Aurelian. I'd just like to call out and say hello to uh, all the Reddit users on the ancient Rome history forum, the subreddit, we had a conversation, I guess it would be a few weeks ago by the time you're listening to this podcast, but it was just a day or two ago uh, for me as I'm recording this episode right now, we had a discussion about Emperor Aurelian, and I ran into a lot of great people on that reddit who had a great love for roman emperors the history of rome but reddit user seen in the skylight not only is a fan of the show and i was happy to meet one of my fans even if it was just over a brief reddit chat not only is he a fan of the show but he's also a big fan of emperor aurelian and while i wasn't planning on uh going too deep into Emperor Aurelian. Because uh, we have this Reddit fan scene in the skylight, I thought I'd take a little bit of time and put a little more effort into Aurelian's biography as we talk about the 3rd century. So this episode's going to go probably a little longer because we're going to give Aurelian a good healthy amount of due here before we move on to other emperors. To start off with, no one really knows where Emperor Aurelian was born. Lucius Domitius Aurelianus is his Roman name. We call him Emperor Aurelian. He was one of these people, you know, the poster child for Gallienus's promotion of the lower ranks to senior positions of authority and wealth. Sources put him somewhere around the provinces of Moesia or Macedonia. And if you've been listening to the previous episode, of course, a lot of Roman emperors either came from that region or spent the vast majority of their times in that region. 
and many Roman emperors, future Roman emperors, will be from this region, the Adriatic, kind of northern Greece areas. Aurelian had a nickname uh, given to him by the troops, and forgive me for my horrible Latin pronunciations, but his nickname was Manu Ad Ferum, otherwise known as Sword in Hand or Hand on Hilt, indicating from Patricia Southern that he was a man of constant readiness and action, or maybe perhaps a reflection of his uncompromising attitudes towards incompetence or dereliction of duty, and that it could also indicate that his nickname was basically Iron Fist. The Roman um, authors of the Historia Augusta, I think, I believe they describe him as cruel and bloodthirsty. So Aurelian has a love-hate relationship with the Roman populace. The Roman people, especially the Roman legions, tend to love him, but the Roman senators, not so much. Aurelian was a thorough and ruthless military commander against a tribe called the uh, Juthingi, I believe it's pronounced. He manages to ambush them in a pass, and he allows, and these are people who've just left raiding Roman, um, pro- pardon me, Roman settlements. He allows the Juthingi to go along with all the slaves and booty that they've taken from Roman citizens, provided... They contribute some 40,000 horsemen and 80,000 infantry to Aurelian's army, which he promptly then turns on the Vandals and devastates the Vandal lands in kind of true Roman total war fashion. He burns the foods, he takes any Thing of movable wealth, destroys settlements. He basically scours the entire countryside. It's scorched earth type policy to starve the Vandals into submission. Aurelian's reign was not all, you know, lovey dovey roses, though, with the citizens of Rome, as I mentioned. The reforms of Gallienus were still strongly in effect. And Aurelian is very happy to keep this policy going. This causes several of the senators to attempt to seize the treasury in Rome and the Roman mint so that they can try and basically kind of starve Aurelian's soldiers and convince them to revolt against him. You know, I'm going to hold the purse strings. You won't get paid. Aurelian puts down the revolt He executes everyone involved. Three other senators are also involved in another attempt to foment a revolt, and they're also sniffed out and put down. His reign was defined by absolute loyalty to the emperor, and suspicion of treason was good enough to get you killed, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. By 271, Aurelian has a firm and bloody established tone to his reign, at least amongst the Senate. But he was not without political wits, though. He was a true populace. He loved the carrot as much as he loved the stick. And he was happy to use both as a tool. He savvily handed out 500 denarii donatives to the entire populace of Rome to help buy the loyalty of the struggling people with a one-time bribe. And he was also happy to burn the records of debt of the populace that the moneylenders had, and these moneylenders would be the senators. Under Aurelian, he further handicapped the Senate, kind of continuing the policy of the concentration of power from Gallienus. After the Senate confirmed the usual powers of emperor to Aurelian, Aurelian promptly turned around and then removed all the legislative authority from the senators, basically making them a a group of a bunch of rich old men who had no power aside from the wealth that they had. All the legislative authority was folded into the office of the emperor forever, 
locking Aurelian in as a totalitarian authority. Aurelian has a kind of mythical status as a military figure, and we will talk about that in just a moment, but it's important to know that Aurelian was human just as much as every other Roman. There's a lot of myth-making involved, kind of ignoring the struggles of the time, and Aurelian was no exception to the struggles previous Roman generals had. His army is actually defeated in battle against the Marcomanni, who invade northern Italy around 271, you know, shortly after he was confirmed as emperor. Aurelian tried to buy off the Marcomanni, who weren't satisfied as the offer of tribute, and instead they opt to raid the Italian settlements in northern Italy after they give Aurelian's army a thrashing in a surprised nighttime attack. Aurelian has to retreat the army, reform it, and then try to chase down the Marcomanni all over northern Italy. Now that he has kind of regained some of his power, and he knows we were, you know, we can't trust the Marcomanni, he's ruthlessly prosecuting the uh, attacks because the Marcomanni, of course, are raiding the Italian countryside, and it's not too far to Rome, so this is basically a make-or-break moment for his emperorship. Like the future Viking raiders in a few hundred years, the Marcomanni have no real strategic military objectives. They're just trying to gather loot and wealth and then leave and take it home. So it's not like he can go and meet them in the field of battle and have an open set piece engagement. He can't say, well, this is the strategic spot, so they're going to go here. So he has to stretch his intelligence networks and try and find out where the Marcomanni are. Only the Marcomanni aren't one big force, like the Viking raiders uh, who would invade northern France and uh, Britain. They may have started as one force to do the initial landing, but then they break off into a bunch of smaller groups. I'm going this way, you're going this way, this over here seems to be a place that's got a lot of loot, and this guy's like, yeah, I got all the loot I need, I'm going to go home, or maybe I want to go over here to this village, because it looks like they've got the, the money. So Aurelian's kind of dealing with an army that's split into many parts, and he's got, you know, just his cavalry force and his giant army, and now he has to make decisions. Either he's got to split his army, and he may have intelligence saying the Marcomanni are, you know, in one location, and then there's a Marcomanni force in another location, but he doesn't have exact numbers. So he's got to guess which one is the bigger strategic threat and then move his army to go and engage them so through this year he has at least three separate engagements with the Marcomanni to try and put them down but he does the fear and ancient memory of Germanic and Gaulish uh, Gaulish tribes raiding the Roman countryside were basically realized this year under the very early reign of Aurelian, and if he didn't have the absolute authority lock on the Senate, he might actually have lost his emperorship during this moment where the Marcomanni are successfully raiding northern Italy. After he locks down the Marcomanni, though, he comes to a realization that the defense of the core Italian cities is not easily achieved once somebody's made it past Milan. And so he opts to begin rebuilding, strengthening, and expanding the walls of Rome. So this is a famous thing a lot of fans of Aurelian will know is the Aurelian Walls. So from 271 to 275, the walls will be rebuilt, strengthened, and expanded. With the Marcomanni defeated, he now and uh, Posthumus and the Gallic Empire no longer a massive threat. They're still definitely a concern, but with Spain now back on his side, they're a lot less threatening. 
But there's a problem, though, with the East. And if you remember a few minutes ago, we were talking about Zenobia and the Palmyrin state. Well, Zenobia ha turns her eyes on Egypt because Aurelian gives command, or, or pardon me, gives orders to the head of the Egyptian legions to go and deal with the Goths, the pirate raiders, who have now moved from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean Sea, and they're now threatening all the Mediterranean trade. And so as the Egyptian legions leave Egypt to go and deal with this, Zenobia and the Palmyrin state see this as a good opportunity to go and conquer Egypt and seize the grain supply, which they do. Now, Zenobia, by this time, her son, uh, Vabalathus, I think is the name, they're still, as much as I said, not really declaring themselves emperors, but they start to kind of hint at that at this time, calling themselves king of kings, issuing coinage with their faces, stopping the issuing of coinage of the emperors in Rome. Even though Zenobia and uh, Vabalathus take Egypt, they don't shut down the grain supply to Rome. They just... I guess, accept, or take all the wealth that that earned from trade for themselves. But still, that's a major threat. It's a major black eye to Aurelian to lose Egypt. And so Aurelian now has to go deal with Palmyra. And he does this by first moving through Turkey and the provinces of Asia Minor, and as he goes through there, most of the cities in those provinces just immediately surrender. From their perspective, they probably all thought they were Romans anyway. Many, pardon me, many of them probably don't care who is the king so long as they're being protected. Many of them, like I said, they all thought they were Romans, but didn't have any legions with them to do anything about it. So they had to accept the reality of Palmyrin control. But now that Rome's coming through, please well, throw open the doors, the gates. Aurelian does have to siege one city out of the entire provinces of Asia Minor. But anyways, one city is not a big deal. He has two set-piece kind of land engagements with Zenobia and the Palmerans. The first one is a full rout of the Palmeran army. The second engagement happens just outside the city of Palmyra, and Zenobia uh, inflicts heavy casualties on Aurelian's forces, but ends up losing, and Zenobia is captured as she tries to flee to Persia. Aurelian retakes Egypt, and as he's moving back to Rome some months later, for whatever reason, the Palmerans take it upon themselves to attempt a second revolt, and they take Egypt a second time, and this time they do seize the grain shipments, attempting to cripple Aurelian's grip on the Italian peninsula. It fails horribly for the Palmerans, though, because Aurelian's lightning-fast mobile army is able to get there quickly, and for whatever reason, the Palmerans had not even rebuilt the walls from the last siege just a few months earlier. And so Aurelian is able to basically walk in and slaughter the entire city. He levels it. It's after this fact, it becomes just a small trading outpost, not the major city that it had been for hundreds of years up until this point. With the richest portion of the Roman Empire now firmly back into the fold, Aurelian has one target left and that is the breakaway Gaulish Empire under Postumus. Back in Gaul, as I mentioned during the reign of Gothicus, 
the Gallic Empire is struggling both internally and externally. The struggles caused Spain to break away during the reign of Gothicus and pledge back to Rome. Posthumus, who's the titular empire of Rome, but in Gaul, is not only dealing with trying to build walls around multiple cities to fortify them against the Germanic tribes, he's also dealing with putting down the frequent raids from the Franks and the other Germanic tribes. And he is also dealing with internal revolts within the province of Gaul. No less than two revolts happened during his reign over just a couple year period. The local legions under his control actually assassinate Posthumus over his refusal to allow the legions to sack a Roman settlement that had rebelled. Posthumus clearly wanting unity within the breakaway province and the legions wanting to satisfy that short-term gratification need of getting to sack a city. And if you're at all wondering about what the experience is of being in a city that sacked, you can go back and listen to episode one in my Fall of the Tower of Babylon series, where we talk about actual accounts and the experiences of being in an ancient city during a siege. With the assassination of Posthumus, Gaul seems to fall into its own mini-crisis with a quick succession of four or so emperors that last only a few months each before each is killed in kind by the other. By 273, Aurelian has wrapped up Palmyra and is mobilized and ready to take on the last Gaulish emperor, and that's Emperor Tetricus. There are two separate accounts of the clash of these rival emperors. In one account, Tetricus has sent a letter in secret looking to surrender to Aurelian without a fight, but wishing to save face, and that they had a largely performative battle without any real serious confrontation, allowing Tetricus to claim he fought bravely but lost. And in the second version, they had a full-on real set-piece battle, and Tetricus is soundly defeated. Whatever the truth is, the mints in Gaul were printing new cloins, proclaiming Aurelian the restorer of the world by the end of that year. Britain quickly followed suit and returned to the fold voluntarily without Aurelian having to set foot on Britannia. Aurelian returns to Rome and holds a triumph, displaying both Tetricus and Zenobia as trophies. Zenobia survives the ordeal, albeit as a permanent guest of the Roman Empire, and Tetricus is allowed to keep his fortune and titles and honor intact, but he's given a much less powerful post, so he can't be a threat. Shortly after this, though, it's not all champagne and roses for Aurelian, he finds he's unable to effectively defend the Roman province of Dacia, so that would be modern-day parts of Ukraine and Romania. And he orders the complete evacuation of the province. Many Roman historians laid the blame for this on Gallienus, but the timing actually likely places the decision in primary evacuation activities under the reign of Aurelian. This, and perhaps the early loss to the Marcomanni who ravaged northern Italy for a year, appear to be the only two black marks on an otherwise sterling career as emperor. A man who's known and proclaimed by the Romans as the restorer of the world, albeit with somewhat less territory than there had been just a couple decades earlier. 
Aurelian is an absolute totalitarian monarch at the height of his glory and fame and had his divinity backdated to his birth so that he was effectively born a god and locking around as a living god. By now, he's taken to wearing gold cloth and a crown and demanding that subjects bow in obedience to him. You can see some of the Eastern influences there, and this would be a precedent set that Diocletian would take up not only a a decade later. The economic reforms of Gallienus continued by Gothicus and continued by Aurelian have left the economy ravaged. Inflation is out of control, and the monetary system is foundering. In an attempt to resolve the issue, we've have Aurelian has newfound wealth coming in from the reconstituted empire, albeit not so much in terms of precious metals. New taxes were implemented, particularly targeting the wealthy, who no doubt resented that. Food supplies were also a problem. The grain supply from Africa was iffy. There's harvest problems, and Aurelian reforms the ancient grain dole that had been in place for hundreds of years, and instead creates a donation of bread that's kind of a fixed size that all the bakers in uh, the Italian provinces do for free. Aurelian also reforms the religion. The empire is vast, there are gods all over the world, but those who know Aurelian well will know that Aurelian introduced the famous sun god Sol as the supreme being in the Roman Empire pantheon. It seemed to be a way to offend the least amount of people while also including the vast majority of the population as a worship of a single unifying force of which he was a divine entity of. In 275, not even five years into his reign, Aurelian sets out to invade Persia, now under the Persian king Varam, and in at least one version of the story, In another version of this story, Aurelian is already at war with the Goths in Dacia over renewed border raiding. Regardless of whether or not Valerian's army was on its way to Syria to invade Persia, or whether he was already there fighting the Goths again in Dacia, A plot is hatched to have Aurelian assassinated, and the details of this are untrustworthy, so take it with a grain of salt. But supposedly, a court official worried about severe punishment by Aurelian for an epic screw-up instead forged a fictitious hit list of officers in Aurelian's army, that Aurelian was supposedly planning to have killed. The court functionary then shows the forged document to the supposed targets, who, fearing Aurelian's wrathful nature, took no chances and instead proactively assassinated him. You have to wonder whether or not there was real problems with the people on this hit list that they would so easily without question just oh that's my name on a list let's go kill Aurelian was it really so rosy the relationship between himself and his generals did these senior officers really have a problem with Aurelian were they perhaps actually fomenting revolt and this guy just happened to make some educated guesses based on you know, hearsay and rumors and whatnot. Whatever the reasons were, Aurelian is assassinated in the fall of 275, less than five years into his reign. But five years as emperor, he reconstituted the Roman Empire, instituted 
reforms to the religion that would have lasting impacts into the future. He's reformed the economy, reformed the ancient grain dole. He's implemented reforms to the religion, instituting a policy of worship of a single unifying figure, the sun god, Sol. So I hope you can see how uh, Valerian could be seen as such a monumental uh, figure in the list of emperors as a significant standout. Building on the reforms of Gallienus and taking the apex predator army that he built and stitching the empire back together with it, that and some savvy politicking and good timing. We spent a lot of time on Aurelian, and that's great. I wanted to give thanks to my friends on the Ancient Rome subreddit forum uh, and their love of Aurelian and thought I would make sure we give Aurelian his due here. With that in mind, we're going to end the episode here. I was hoping, as I said in the start, to be able to get Diocletian, the Tetrarchy, the Christian persecutions, and of course the life and time of St. George all into this episode. I wanted to wrap everything up in a nice holiday bow for December, but it didn't, like I said, the length was getting a little too much. So what I am going to do though is take the rest of the episode, the parts on Diocletian, Christian persecution, you know, St. Pat or St. George, and I will be releasing an extra bonus episode later in December. Normally, this is a monthly show, but I've already got the content recorded. It just didn't squeeze into one episode. So if you're got time over the holidays and you uh, want to hear a merry story of Christian persecutions, look for the final episode in season one of the Grimdark History to be coming probably somewhere around the middle of the month. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you to all my new subscribers and fans and those people who were engaging with me on the Ancient Rome subreddit. Um, you guys are great. You've got a real love of history, and I appreciate you all. Everybody have a happy holidays and Merry Christmas. See you in the new year.